This is part one of diseases and conditions of the circulatory system. Coronary artery disease. The coronary arteries become narrowed by atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic plaque, which lines the lumen of the coronary arteries. We have ischemia. Angina pectoris. The chest pain due to ischemia of the myocardium occurs during or shortly after exertion. A myocardial infarction is when you see the death of myocardial tissue due to ischemia. This is a circulation problem. Blood to the heart is blocked. Cardiac markers following NMI. You have this uh, in the CPK, you have the CKMB ISO enzyme, which is specific to cardiac muscle. Okay, these elevate four to six hours and return to baseline in two to four days. Okay, the LDH, and then you have the LDH1, and um, you have, I'm sorry, LD1 and LD2. <clears throat> Uh, this is uh, not detectable until 24 to 48 hours post MI and they remain elevated for a week. The uh, troponin, the troponin T and the troponin I, these transmit calcium signal signals that trigger muscle contraction and it's detectable 3 to 12 hours post MI, peaks at 12 to 24 hours and remains elevated. Um, greater than one week and less than three weeks. Okay, now in that LD, normally LD2 is greater than LD1, but in an MI, LD1 is greater than LD2, and that we call that the uh, LD flip, and and that, L, that LD1 will remain elevated for two weeks. A cardiac arrest. This is a sudden unexpected cessation of cardiac activity and this is an electrical problem. An irregular heartbeat caused by an electrical malfunction triggers cardiac arrest. The heart is unable to pump blood to the brain, lungs and other organs. Okay, hypertension. Essential hypertension is when you have an abnormally high blood pressure and it has an insidious onset. Um, greater than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Now malignant hypertension is life-threatening. It's idiopathic and it's the severe form of hypertension. There's a sudden onset and the blood pressure would be greater than or equal to 200 over 120 millimeters of mercury. Stress is a major contributing factor in hypertension. Congestive heart failure is a chronic inability of the heart to pump enough blood through the body to meet the demands of homeostasis. And so you get a hypoperfusion of the organs. Um, the pumping action of the heart becomes less and less powerful. Um, the blood starts to back up. This increases the pressure in the blood vessels and forces fluid from the blood vessels into the body tissues. On the right side of the heart, the fluid collects in feet and lower legs. The left side of the heart, the fluid builds up in the lungs. Core pulmonale, the right ventricular hypertrophy um, as a sequel to primary lung disease. Pulmonary edema, fluid shifts into the extravascular spaces in the lungs and this makes breathing difficult. Cardiomyopathy. This is a non-inflammatory disease of cardiac muscle, um, enlargement of the myocardium, and you have ventricular dysfunction. In this first one, the dilated uh, cardiomyopathy, the heart chambers dilate and the myocardium doesn't contract normally. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the myocardium enlarges and ventricular walls, especially their left ventricle, thicken. They can block the flow of blood out of the ventricle. And in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the ventricles are stiff and rigid. Scar tissue replaces normal myocardium. The ventricles can't relax and fill with blood. Over time, blood flow to the heart is reduced. Pericarditis is an acute or chronic inflammation of the pericardium, which is the sac surrounding the heart. Okay, and this right here 
all right, is the parietal pericardium. And this part right here, the second one, is the visceral pericardium. And it's also called the epicardium. Myocarditis is the inflammation of the muscular walls of the heart. Endocarditis is the inflammation of the lining and valves of the heart. The bacteria can cause um, vegetations, and vegetations are abnormal growths of tissue surrounding a valve. They're composed of platelets, bacteria, and fibrin. Vegetations are friable, which means they're easily disintegrated. Rheumatic heart disease, um, cardiac manifestations following rheumatic fever. The vegetations may enlarge and the valves may scar. <clears throat> it's caused by hemolytic streptococcal infections, um, produces lesions at specific sites, especially in the heart and joints, thought to be mediated by antibodies produced against streptococcus pyogenes that cross-react react with human heart tissue. It's found in people who have rheumatic fever, causes heart valve leaflets to become inflamed, may cause leaflets to stick together and become scarred, rigid, thickened, and shortened. Mitral stenosis. This is the hardening of the cusps of the mitral valve. It prevents complete and normal opening. The tissue forming the valve leaflets becomes stiffer, narrowing the valve opening and reducing the amount of blood that goes through. Mitral valve regurgitation. The leaflets do not close completely, letting blood leak backward into the valve. So you have, um, mit and it's called leaky valve. So mitral valve insufficiency, the mitral valve doesn't close completely. And mitral valve prolapse, the mitral valve bulges back into the left atrium when it closes. Now the electricity of the heart. Okay, so we have the SA node right here, okay? So the SA node is located in the upper portion of the right atrium where the superior vena cava and the atrium meet, okay? Now, the heartbeat begins at the a SA node. The AV node, which is right here, is located in the lower part of the wall between the atria near the ventricles. The AV node delays transmission of the electrical current so that the atria can contract completely, contract completely. And right here, you have the bundle of Hiss. The AV bundle is specialized muscle fibers. It is located in the upper portion of the interventricular septum. Okay, so that's right there. And then you have the left and right bundle branches. And these innervate the ventricles. And then right down here, you have the Purkinje fibers. And these are located in the subendothelium and rapidly conduct electrical impulses in the ventricles. So the SA node activates the atria, and that's the P wave. The atria contract. Actually, you know what? Let me show you the next slide. It'll make things a lot easier. OK, so the SA node activates the atria. Okay. And this is the P wave right here. The atria contract and force blood into the ventricles. The ventricles are activated, and that's that QRS complex. The electrical current spreads back over the ventricles in the opposite direction, and that's the T wave right here, and that's also known as the recovery wave. So the EKG represents electrical current moving through the heart during a heartbeat. A normal EKG would have a normal sinus rhythm, NSR. Okay, so let's look at some strips. We're going to be looking at dysrhythmias. These are abnormal heart rhythms. They're either irregular, too fast, or too slow. So this is sinus bradycardia. Now, whenever you see sinus, that means the rhythm starts in the SA node. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. The heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. The SA node fires slower than normal for the patient's age. Sinus tachycardia, this is also a normal sinus rhythm, but the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. The normal heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute, by the way. So the SA node fires faster than normal for the patient's age. The first degree heart block. 
this the conduction through the AV node is delayed. The normal PRI, which is the PR interval, the uh, distance from P, the P wave to the R, um, is 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds. Okay, and so the PRI is greater than 0.2 seconds. Atrial flutter. You have one strong ectopic focus in the atrium, which fires regularly at a rapid rate. Okay, so the atrial rate could be 240 to 340 beats per minute. And this right here, you look this this four to one is the um, the rate of the um, it's the atrial rate to the ventricular rate. So in this, an atrial flutter, you get and you get this what they call a sawtooth pattern. The AV node acts as a gatekeeper, allowing only some impulses through the ventricles, protects the ventricles. Normally, the AV node cannot conduct faster than approximately 180 impulses per minute. If the atrial rate is 300 beats per minute, every other impulse arrives at the AV node. The ventricular rate is 150 beats per minute, and it would go in a 2 to 1 conduction. Atrial fibrillation, this, these are rapid, random, ineffectual, and irregular contractions of the heart, and that's greater than 350 beats per minute. You have many weak ectopic foci in the atria that beat in an uncoordinated pattern. They call, you have a coarse baseline and an irregular distance between the contractions, and, which, and that characterizes the rhythm. Ventricular tachycardia, this is a rapid deadly rhythm of the ventricles. You have one strong ventricular ectopic fo focus and it's 1 to 250 beats per minute. Now these ectopic uh, foci are little um, areas uh, uh, that are for lack of a better word they're oxygen starved. They're deprived of oxygen and they're irritable. Okay so when they're irritable they just you know, send signals, and the heart, uh, in response to that, will contract. Ventricular fibrillation, this is a deadly rhythm. Many small ectopic foci in the ventricles. There's no effective myocardial contraction, and it does not generate a pulse. The ventricular muscles quiver. In asystole, this is cardiac standstill, or a flat line. It's associated with death. There's absence of all electrical activity. Okay, shock. This is the widespread ineffective tissue perfusion that if not treated properly will lead to irreversible cellular injury. It's a collapse of the cardiovascular system. There is insufficient blood flow throughout the body. Okay, so before we talk about the different ones, let me tell you about um, two words that you need to know. They're going to talk about cardiac output and this is the amount of blood pumped into the aorta each minute by the heart. Okay, that's the cardiac output. And the stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected from a ventricle with each heartbeat. Now you can have several different types. You can have hypovolemic shock and this is when you have low blood volume. This is usually due to hemorrhage or fluid loss. And then you have cardiogenic shock, um, and this is a cardiac pump failure. It can be caused by arrhythmias, um, acute myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, or pericarditis. Distributive shock has to do with vasodilation. Um, septic shock, anaphylaxis, or a drug or a toxin. Addisonian crisis or neurogenic. Uh, I'm sorry, Addisonian crisis. Um, you have neurogenic shock. This is a sudden loss of signals from the sympathetic nervous system that maintain the normal tone in blood vessel walls. The vessel dilate, blood pools, and blood pressure decreases. Uh, and the last one is obstructive shock. This is uh, circulation is physically obstructed. There's inadequate blood oxygenation. It's caused by a tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, or pulmonary embolism. This is a progressive buildup of air within the pleural space. Allows air to escape into the pleural space, but not return. They can breathe in, but not out, usually due to a lung laceration. 
the mediastinum shifts and obstructs venous return to the heart.